Oh, howdy all, grab yourself a beer, it's time for some Path of Exile discussion. Today, a monumental document to get through, we want to discuss the patch notes for 3.15 Expedition, and this is going to detail all the sort of balance changes that are happening, and they're sweeping changes to almost every support gem in the game. Uh, as well as that, there's a whole lot of other things to go through. So firstly, uh, on the smaller things, there's a little bit of hidden information at the start. So as well as the passive tree data and item, uh, there's the item filter information, which is not included in the main patch notes. Uh, and this lists all the new items that are found in the game. Uh, one of them is my divination card, the price of prescience. Uh, so we will get a picture of that fairly soon. I haven't seen what it looks like. I don't know the set size. I don't know where it drops. Uh, but it is for a 100% delirious Vile Temple map uh, with Corrupted Rare, so it'll be random mods. And it'll be a meat grinder map, it'll be something that will, uh, you know, cause a lot of characters to die, I hope, uh, and that should be a little bit of fun for people to uh, try to defeat. The bosses of the Vile Temple are pretty mean at 100% delirious, uh, because Kaj ILI certainly hits hard even without any delirium layers in play. What the delirium layers do is they make the bosses take something like 10 times as long to kill, and that means that they have more time to do their deadly stuff. So, other things that we got in here are in this uh, section is the changes that are happening to the Atlas. Uh, so there's not any sweeping changes announced to passive nodes on the uh, for Maven points. The only real one is the King Harbingers are being nerfed a bit. Uh, however, there's a few interesting little changes. The first one that's really flown under the radar are uh, altered base types. Thrusting one-handed sword item class has been changed to one-handed sword. Now, there are two types of one-handed swords currently. There are the more rapier style ones. So these are the ones that take up a one by four spot in your inventory. And these are generally speaking, like they have one set of mods. Then there's the, the other types of one-handed swords. These are the ones that usually have an accuracy implicit on them. Uh, and these take up a two by three spot in your inventory. So it looks like all of the thrusting one-handed swords have been changed to be one-handed swords as well. Now, the big imp uh, implication here is that the corruption pools are different, noticeably different, and the thrusting one-handed swords have exceptionally good corruptions. So, it may be that this is the end for Cosprey's Malice with plus one projectile. Uh, it may also be the end of Cosprey's Malice with resolute technique, which, you know, you take the good with the bad, I guess. Uh, there's also been a number of other changes, like diamond flasks have just been changed as to a normal utility flask. That just changes the mods that can roll on them, restoring the ability for them to roll the uh, the Surgeon's Affix. And then there's a few changes to the Pantheon that uh, souls, like to which soul is linked to which boss. Uh, but then we have the map tiers, and the thing that's interesting is that a bunch of maps that are significant are low tier. So Beach, one of the smoothest layouts in the game. Uh, Mesa and Park are also very smooth layouts. And then you've got Channel, which is one of the maps in which you can farm a, a Humility Divination card. I'm not so sure people are going to be so keen on farming Humility this league. Uh, because of the changes to all of the support gems, I actually don't think Tabula Rasa is a good early end game uh, piece of equipment anymore. I think you would rather have a 5 link with stats. In previous leagues, I've gone the other way. Uh, in previous leagues, I would prefer, at least in softcore, to be wearing a uh, Tabula Rasa rather than having a life resist piece of armor. I think now I would rather have a 5 link with life and resist and you might even consider a four link with life and resist if the mods on it were good. So for that reason, uh, channel map is there, but I'm not that not that excited by that information. Uh, then we have all of the other tiers. Uh, the things that are probably most notable, uh, tier seven, port and desert spring, two very good tile sets. What this means is that sometimes when you're running league content, particularly recent league content from heist onwards, you'll get maps that drop with delirium layers pre-applied to them. If you get tier seven maps, uh, keep them and horizon them into port or desert spring. Uh, both of them are pretty good choices for delirium maps, uh, for delirium layers, uh, desert spring because of its massive number of monsters and port because of its good divination cards. So uh, tier 13 also has a uh, reasonably good choices of things to horizon maps as well. Uh, and that's going to make the divination card Triskaidekaphobia, uh, the fear of the number 13, a little bit better. Triskaidekaphobia is absolutely a trade league card only. Uh, and it's generally one of those ones that's awkward to compile sets of because it's a set of 13 and the cards are usually only three or four chaos each. So people don't answer to trade because they're in the middle of a map or whatever. Uh, but that's the divination card for an eight mod, five delirium layer tier 13 map. Uh, basically of the four things that can roll, uh, Mausoleum is okay, Courtyard is okay, 
Shaw and Coves are great. So it's the, the Divination card is going to be pretty good this league. Uh, then we have a bunch of reasonably good layouts at Tier 14, uh, slightly weaker layouts at 15 and 16. Uh, and at 16, though, does have Underground Sea as a map that you can horizon orb any undesirable Tier 16 map into. So the Atlas changes, the Atlas shakeups. we need to know what regions things are in. That'll also impact things. Uh, but there's a bunch of little information there. Now, um, we'll come to the things about the Iron Flask later. I have that in my notes, but we'll talk about that when we get to it because it's explained in the patch notes. Uh, but that's basically the thoughts that I had from the item filter information. Uh, the Iron Flask looks kind of interesting. It is ward related. So we are now going to go through, and first thing I want to note is that shields can use weapon effects. So this is purely a cosmetic change. But if you are using one of the new skills that involves uh, shield attacks, or even if you just have a shield equipped, uh, there are two changes that are being made. One, has or one is already going to happen as soon as 3.15 goes live. That is the ability to apply a weapon effect onto your shield. The second one, and this has not happened yet, but will be in a future patch, uh, to, uh, there'll be an update that allows you to apply the supporter pack specific weapon effects uh, to your weapon and then have that also affect your shield. So, you know, you'll only have one of, let's say that you've got the uh, the weapon effect from the ASEA supporter pack, uh, one of the tiers of that, uh, you would then have that apply to your weapon and also to your shield, but that hasn't happened yet. At the moment, it's one or the other. Uh, at, well, sorry, at the moment, you can't do it at all. In 3.15.0, it's going to be one or the other in some point in the future, probably pretty soon maybe 3.15.1, uh, it'll apply to both. So uh, there's a couple of little changes that have flown under the radar, and there's also a number of changes that have been overstated by people. The first thing I want to say is that there's been a lot of talk about massive sweeping nerfs to evasion. Uh, I had a few comments questioning uh, that were asking me about that when I was going through these notes on stream earlier. Uh, there are changes to baseline evasion. Uh, so you go from 353 evasion at level 100, down to 15 evasion. This is your baseline evasion before any gear is equipped. This is not nothing, but it's not big. Uh, for a lot of characters, this might be the difference between evading 73% of hits and evading 72%. Uh, so it's pretty much a nothing change. Consecrated Ground, however, has been absolutely gutted. Uh, it basically doesn't exist as a mechanic that you should pay attention to anymore. I mean, it's still there. It still provides a little bit of uh, life regeneration, but it's just not really important. Melee skills across the board pretty much picked up a uh, 25% damage increase unless they were super meta ones. And this is a partial compensation for the support gem changes. Uh, so melee skills are going to improve relative to the meta. Uh, and this is not going to include Cyclone, which is only getting a 10% buff. Melee skills are improving relative to the meta because of all of the sort of uh, gem changes that are happening. Uh, spell gems are going to be coming down a little bit. So firstly, there's all of the usual stuff at the start, the preamble material on any set of patch notes, Expedition Challenge League, and then all of this major new content and features, which is basically just, here's a, over, here's a high level overview of all the new skill gems we're adding. Uh, here's a high level overview of Ward. I did a video on Ward. I think it's probably better than people are giving it credit for, uh, but I really want to play with it in practice and see. And there is a ward-related flask, the Iron Flask, which grants additional ward and restores ward on use. Uh, we've got the Enkindling Orb and Instilling Orb, which are the currency items related to flasks. Those have been mentioned a bit in the live stream, but basically one of them causes your enchantment, uh, causes your flasks to basically be more powerful than they otherwise would be, uh, sort of closer perhaps to their functionality in the 3.14 expansion. Uh, but they prevent them from gaining charges while a flask is running. The instilling orb does something quite different where it and it uh, adds an enchantment to a utility flask that will cause it to trigger under certain conditions. Both of these can be found as drops throughout the game. Uh, then there's the divination cards, unique items, and equipment-based types. One thing of note is that there are only nine new equipment-based types, and what this means is that ward is not going to be available as a chess piece uh, source of... Uh, uh, source of alternative to armor, evasion, and energy shield. So you're only going to be able to get it on gloves, on boots, and on helmets, and that's going to severely constrain the amount of it that you can stack. That said, I don't think you want to stack ward. I think you just want to 
take advantage of it on builds uh, without really going all in on it. So uh, minor new content and features is just a couple of little visual updates. Uh, the one thing that's cool though here is that the Templar has received audio dialogue for part two. So Acts 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Hopefully this is going to continue to the other classes as well. Uh, it certainly does sort of push me maybe slightly towards wanting to play a Templar early on uh, in the league to experience that. Uh, but that is something that's being changed that I think will be welcome change. And if they can do that for the other six ascendancies over the next couple of expansions, that'll be good. Uh, and then hopefully Path of Exile 2, I expect, will have uh, the entire new campaign. will have voiceovers for all of the characters in it. So the other thing that's of note is that there's a number of changes in Act 1. Act 1 is being made harder. So the standard play style through Act 1 for experienced and even really semi-experienced players, we're not talking just... We're not talking just the top 10,000 players here. We're talking basically everyone that hits level 90 over a league. Uh, their default behavior in Act 1 was usually to just blitz through it, killing as few monsters as, as you needed to in order to stay alive. Uh, you know, hit level 10 maybe by the time that you fight Mavale. I think what's going to happen is that that, is going, that meta is going to change. People are going to spend more time killing monsters in Act 1 uh, you're going to want to pick up a little bit more equipment early on, uh, and you might even see an end to the meta where people tend not to equip a chess piece. Now, this is more of something that only people at the more power gamer end do. A lot of players that are experienced with, with running the campaign fast don't equip a chess piece until they're quite some way through the campaign. That's because chess pieces have 3 or 6% movement speed decreases on them as a hidden stat. 3% if they've got no strength requirement, 6% if they've got a strength requirement. So with these changes, you might find that players actually do start equipping chess pieces as well in Act 1, uh, just for that little bit of extra uh, set of stats and also just armor, evasion, or energy shield, depending on the equipment. Uh, monster life has been increased early on, 46% at level 1, but down to no increase at level 84. So this will be something that means that, again, the whole hit once uh, meta is going to probably be over through the early game. Uh, you're going to hit monsters more than one. Are you going to need to hit monsters a few more times? Now, fundamentally, what I think they're doing here uh, is that they're trying to make it so that monsters survive to, in order to be able to retaliate. Long Sorry, survive longer so that they can retaliate against us. Uh, and then we can try and dodge their attacks or we can endure them depending upon our character stats. Uh, at low level... This is being achieved through a flat increase in monster hit points. Uh, and Hillock is an exception. I think Brutus is an exception to this. Uh, they're not getting these buffs. But uh, by level 84, they're achieving this same goal through the support gem nerfs. So I think that's what their overall goal is, that monsters will endure longer, uh, which means that we will, we will fight less monsters uh, per hour of gameplay, uh, and those monsters will live longer and be able to fight back a bit more. Because it's... Sorry, it's Hillock and Uzback that have had their life reduced to partially counteract this change. Uh, so the Uzback is particularly obnoxious. Like he's one of those bosses that uh, you always want to avoid fighting because he takes a while and he's gonna he'd be even worse if he had more hit points. Monster pack size has been buffed in late areas of Act One and nerfed in the coast. Uh, so reducing it slightly in the coast is is probably a good thing because that area is surprisingly dangerous for. A, you know, for one of the first areas in the game, we've got monsters with ranged attacks that leave burning burning ground behind. Uh, it's just a lot of sketchy monsters. Uh, so having a few less monsters will make that zone safer. And we'll also su suggest for sort of funneling you a little bit further through the storyline before you start farming. I think it'll still be the case that any player that goes out of their way to farm XP in Act 1 will still absolutely dominate all of the content in, that, in the Act. Uh, and that includes brand new players that are just totally unfamiliar with Path of Exile. Uh, where you will find people get it coming unstuck will be people that try to use the same speedrunning strategies of, you know, of a week ago. There's new monsters that have been added, uh, and unfortunately one of them is Tar Zombies. Tar Zombies are currently, I think, found mostly in the uh, Eternal Labyrinth, uh, in the Crypt-type indoor areas, and those are the zombies that instead of leaving a Chaos Damage crowd, a cloud, they leave a Hindering Cloud when they die, a, literally it's Tar, viscous tar that your character has a reduced movement speed when in. Uh, these things are just annoying to fight at close range. 
this is going to mean that uh, Act 1 is going to feel a bit worse on melee characters, and I'm, this is a change I don't like. Uh, broadly speaking, I think the rest of the Act 1 changes seem pretty good, but this one, no. Uh, there have been new monsters added to the Cavern of Wrath, and there's been new monsters added to the Cavern of Anger. Brutus has renovated his area, so presumably that means there'll be a few changes there, uh, and then there's been some other little minor changes. Flasks. Flasks are talked about in my initial thoughts on the uh, on the uh, leak announcement. Uh, this is just going to be a total new system for Path of Exile. It's going to significantly reduce the very the power of the very very top end players. Basically, anyone that's a better player than me uh, will find that the flask changes nerf is enormous to them. For players that are uh, like that sort of get to twenty four to thirty six challenges a league, but that aren't doing 40, aren't doing the feared in week one. Uh, the flask changes will be a smaller nerf because you probably weren't using flasks as well as the likes of Tai Tai Killer were. You know, the very best players in the game. And the players that are more middling, I think it'll mean that uh, flask use is more tactical and less 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, so that's, that's the intent they're going for. I think that some of the changes will feel like... Uh, some of the changes I'll get right, some of them they won't. Uh, and we'll probably see iteration on this over time. Every unique flask has been rebalanced as well, and some of them have been transformed considerably. So here's that thing I was mentioning about base character evasion rating. Don't worry about this. This is pretty meaningless for most players. Uh, it's like going to have a tiny, tiny effect in some situations. Gamewide Poison now deals 50% more damage. So this is going to be real buff to characters that are using poison that are not assassins. Assassins have other nerfs that counteract this. Uh, and additionally, this is also going to be a considerable buff to monsters that are in zones where uh, that have the effect er uh, enemies poison on hit. So this is a map mod uh, that comes up, and you're going to find that that map mod is going to be a lot scarier than it used to be. That said, it's still not going to be all that scary a map mod. Uh, it's just not going to be an absolute free uh, bunch of quantity now. Uh, all in all, I think that these game-wide poison changes, these would be really scary, except that they're nerfing some of the poison-heavy bosses. I think the danger here comes from uh, monsters that use cyclone skills. So uh, I think it's Kaj Yaraz in Vile Temple is one of them. Uh, if you encounter one of those in conjunction with a monster's poison uh, zone, that's going to be really dangerous. And I think Kaji Araz is not the only Cycloner in the game either. There'll be a few others. Okay, so then we have uh, Consecrated Ground effect here. Yeah, we've talked about Consecrated Ground. Uh, Consecrated Ground basically is absolutely and utterly uh, a non-thing now. It's The Bottle Faith Flask is still good. It's been nerfed, but it is still good. Uh, but otherwise, I think Consecrated Ground is just not a thing now. Uh, now, we've got a couple of uh, skill gem balance notes here. Something that's interesting, they're saying that they're adding a prismatic gem tag. This applies to skills which pick a random element to attack with, avoiding choosing the same element twice in a row, Elemental Hit and Wild Strike being two examples. Now, the question that this raises for me, I didn't think of this, this was brought up in my stream. Uh, previously, Elemental Hit has had the Fire, Cold and Lightning tags and this has allowed it to benefit from thing from items like frostferno uh, and particularly a corrupted frostferno that has let's say plus two to the level of socketed lightning gems suddenly you're looking at plus six to the level of elemental hit i don't know what this change means for frostferno uh, but it's something that is going to be impactful if those if those fire lightning and uh cold tags are replaced by the prismatic tag then that's going to mean that Frostferno as an item is dead. I uh, don't think people are going to use it for discharge, and that's the only option that would remain. Uh, then there's just a quality of life change. Shield-related sh uh, skill gems now display their critical strike chance and attack damage at the top of the skill gem hover. Uh, that's going to be an absolute, absolutely huge. Okay, so now let's go through all of the changes to specific skills. We're not going to discuss every single one. We're going to discuss the ones that I think are interesting. Uh, but firstly, melee skills, the bad ones got 25% across the board, 25% uh, more damage. This is going to approximately half deal with the support gem changes. Uh, and so I think that for a lot of melee builds, they will end up doing about 75 to 80% of the damage that they dealt in the 3.14 era. Uh, but 
there will be some of the better ones will end up doing less damage than that. So Cyclone, for instance, will be closer to 65 to 70% of the damage it was dealing in 3.14. Uh, but the uh, the other ones like, um, you know, say, uh, Reeve, for instance, will or Double Strike, these will get the full, uh, the full 25%, which will offset most of that nerf. Uh, surprisingly, a number of the slam skills get the full 25%. Now, slams are copying a significant nerf in the fact that Seismic Cry is basically being removed from their builds. However, uh, the fact that slams are picking up so much else elsewhere makes me think that slam builds may be... A, a new type of slam build may very well be meta. Uh, I would certainly be looking at Earth Shatter. I would certainly be looking at um, other slams as very realistic choices for League Start. Uh, possibly as a champion, possibly as a berserker, uh, or possibly as a juggernaut, or possibly yeah, or a gladiator. You know, you just whatever you want. Uh, there's a lot of different ascendancies you can play them with, and they all look pretty good. So we have Fireburst. Fireburst is taking a thump over the head. I think a lot of people expected this. This is the uh, essence modifier, uh, so it's going to go for, for about a thirty percent uh, less multiplier to damage. And it's also going to pick up a 1.5 second cooldown instead of a 1 second cooldown. This is painful, but it's not devastating. I still think that this is viable. Uh, Fireburst Ignite is still a viable choice, but I don't think it's going to be an amazing one. Uh, and I think it's really up to you whether you want to try or try it or not. Uh, it should be a lot easier to get up the uh, to get your hands on the relevant essences, though. Okay, Flame Wall is nerfed pretty noticeably, but is not dead. Uh, I think that Flame Wall, these numbers are not too bad, and that the the skill itself is looking fine. Uh, Lightning Arrow has got a mixed bag, but I think all in all, it's looking pretty good. Just before I touch on that, uh, though, Ground Slam is get is getting that whole 25% buff. Uh, I mentioned Earth Shatter as well, uh, but all of these sorts of melee skills are getting this 25% buff, so 150% baseline to 188% baseline, uh, so Ground Slam is looking pretty good. Lightning Arrow uh, is no longer has increased shock effect, now shocks enemies as though dealing more damage. Uh, well, it already did have that mod, but the numbers are increased. Uh, now deals an increased amount of damage. So basically, overall, what is happening to Lightning Arrow? It does more damage, it doesn't quite shock as hard as it used to, but overall, it is still a better skill than it was. That's my thoughts, and I'm keen to see how it works out in practice. I think a lot of projectile skills are looking pretty good, and Lightning Arrow is definitely one that I think has a lot of potential in the new league. Lightning Spire Trap. Lightning Spire Trap is a skill that was absolutely everywhere during leveling for a period. I believe it may have been Betrayal League. Uh, there was a league where a, one of the most common builds was using Arc Traps. I was playing Arc Traps in that league. And I recall using Lightning Spire Trap as an anti-boss uh, as an anti-boss killer. Now, what happened was that Lightning Spire Trap was so, so, so good for a period that a whole lot of builds that had absolutely zero trap investment would use Lightning Spire Trap as their anti-boss skill during the campaign. So you'd find that people would use a one-linked Lightning Spire Trap, throw down the three of them, because it's one of those traps that you drop down the tra uh, you drop down all the traps, and then there's a long cooldown before you can throw any more. You throw all three of them on the boss before it activated, and then it would activate all the three traps would go off, and these one link traps would pretty much wipe out the boss for you. So Lightning Spire Trap took some big nerfs after that. However, the this was one of the cases, like sometimes uh, GGG under nerf a skill like they did with Winter Orb at the end of Betrayal, sometimes they over nerf it. This Lightning Spire Trap nerf was an over nerf, uh, and it just completely removed the skill from consideration from any build. It's now getting a considerable numerical improvement, and also getting this uh, trap throwing speed modifier instead of cast speed, which is going to be a buff for the sorts of builds that invest in traps. All in all, I think the Lightning Spire Trap is looking kind of good, uh, and it's something that you could conceivably use as an anti-boss skill if your primary clear skill is something like Arc Traps. I would definitely consider those two together if you are uh, thinking of going that way. Uh, next up we have uh, Seismic Cry is the next skill that we want to talk about. And it is just kaput. No one's going to use this anymore. Uh, Seismic Trap got a bunch of buffs. It's the physical version of Lightning Spire Trap. It was never good. Uh, but maybe it'll get there now. I don't know. Uh, it's The numbers are a lot better than they used to be. Uh, I'm not going to try it out and find out. Someone might. 
Uh, but it may end up being really good now as an anti-boss skill. I just don't know. Shield Charge. Shield Charge has been buffed to the moon when it comes to the damage. This may be a serious uh, actual damaging skill now. Like, Shield Charge has been used for mobility for a long time. Uh, I don't like the feel of the skill, but I won't claim that it's not a good skill. It is a good skill, I just find it awkward to use. But Shield Charge is a movement skill that does damage as well, and the damage is getting buffed a lot, especially if you have a massively high amount of armor on your shield. And you can roll a massive amount of armor on your shield. Now, you'll notice that it counts both armor and evasion. Uh, a lot of people have been theory crafting about exactly how you go about crafting shields for uh, shield charge and spectral shield throw and the new shield slap, whatever it's called. I can't think of the name of the new skill. Uh, but the trick for those is you actually want to start with the highest armor pure strength shield. Uh, it might seem counterintuitive. You might think it's better to go with uh, something like a cardinal round shield that has both strength and evasion on it. Oh, so both has uh, armor and evasion on it, but the total is less. You get so much armor on the top shield base type that uh, it ends up being more than any other alternative. But yeah, shield charge is looking pretty good. I uh, don't use shields with any intelligence requirement for shield charge either. You see that it's lost its uh, it's lost its critical strike chance per ten maximum energy shield. That was never a good line, but it's now completely gone. I think it was a bit of a rookie trap, really, the, the trying to make that crit. You don't want this to be a crit skill. You want it to just be uh, something, probably even with resolute technique. Okay, so next up uh, we have Soul Rend. Soul Rend is getting buffed, but probably not enough, uh, especially given that a number of the uh, sort of supports you might have used with it have been nerfed. So yeah, I think that Soul Rend is, uh, is, not, is not time to bring out the Celestial Soul, or Cat Soul Rend again. Uh, next up, we have the skill, uh, the Summon Greater Harbinger of Time from the Torrent's Reclamation, and also the related Summon Harbinger of Time from the Flow Untethered. Uh, so Torrent's Reclamation is getting nerfed hard, but it's not a total dumpstering. Uh, it's going from 20% action speed to 10%. This will affect existing versions of the item. I think this is the end of Torrent's Reclamation as a chase item, uh, but I do think it will still continue to be widely used. Uh, I think that now the best belts, well, obviously there's the mistake of Headhunter, uh, and then I think the next belts below it are probably probably actually going to be, in a lot of cases, the Darkness Enthroned, which is a really common drop from Abyssal Liches. So that's going to be something that I think a lot of people are going to use now. Uh, Wild Strike was the next thing that came to mind. Uh, this has gained that prismatic tech of can no longer choose the same element to attack with twice in a row. Uh, this is approximately a 30% more multiplier to damage if you have elemental equilibrium uh, compared to what its old functionality when you're at low gear level. When you're at high gear level and you have other sources of elemental penetration, it's no longer a 30% more multiplier, uh, but it's still pretty good. So yeah, I was doing the numbers on that, and this is a this is a big change for Wild Strike. It's getting more damage just baseline, and it's got this uh, this extra ability as well. Uh, I think Wild Strike is looking quite a bit better. Uh, and it's a skill I want to research because I don't know very much about it. Now, Val Spectral Throw is being completely overhauled, and it fires eight projectiles in each of two mirrored spirals. Uh, it only can store one use now instead of three. It deals less base damage than it used to do, uh, and it now throws several spectral copies of your melee weapon. Uh, so yeah, we just really need to see what this looks like. Uh, I have no idea whether it's going to be good or not, uh, and... It may be that it's a, that it's miles better. Uh, it may be that it's absolutely terrible. So now we'll talk about support gems. Support gems have had an absolutely transformative uh, balance pass done on them. Uh, broadly speaking, support gems have across the board been nerfed. What's gone on with them is that the ones that were very good have had considerable nerfs on them. A couple of ones that were not used very much, but that uh, they felt or that GG felt might have jumped in to fill the hole, like Bloodlust support, uh, they have also been nerfed considerably. Uh, the amount of damage that you get per support has gone down. And so what this is going to do in practice is it's going to reduce the benefit for having a six link. So a six link is closer to a five link in power. A five link is closer to a four link in power. Uh, in a lot of ways, this is a return in some ways to what Path of Exile looked like when I started playing it. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when I started playing PoE, 
support gems didn't have, there were not as many support gems or nearly as many that had big more multipliers to damage. And so usually you would take one or two supports that added damage and one that was, uh, that was uh, damage projection focused like greater multiple projectiles and use them. And then as you got more gear, you would fit in a third, uh, a third damage support. And then if you were one of the very small number of players at the time that got a six link, uh, then you would be able to have a massive upgrade by putting in another support gem there. However, the support gems had lower numbers. Over time, there's been a lot of a sort of buffing of power of support gems where one patch there'll be, you know, they'll say, for instance, go, all right, well, we're going to introduce vicious projectile support. I'm going to make it pretty good. And then the next leak, everyone's using vicious projectile support. And so they say, oh, well, now we need to buff uh, some alternative to vicious projectiles, such as um, increase, uh, such as added cold damage support or hypothermia support. So that gets buffed instead. And then there's this sort of thing where they keep buffing, 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 buffing. Uh, and this has caused a big power creep spiral that's meant that the gap between a five link and a six link has exploded. Now, this is all about reversing that. Uh, and it's <laughs> reversing it all at once, which is going to be pretty impactful. So expect that most support gems are going to cost a lot more mana to use like, uh, once you've got a few of them stacked together and are also going to add a lot less damage. And the ones that have drawbacks, the drawbacks are going to be much more significant. Uh, the first thing that needs, the first other thing that needs to be said is that mana needs to be mentioned. Before we go through the actual support gems themselves, uh, mana is going to be a really tight thing on a lot of builds that have never cared about mana in the past. So, mana is something that for attack builds has broadly speaking been something you've solved through getting one influence mod or two ring crafts or something like that. Then you've gone and reserved 100% of your mana. This, the days of doing that are probably over now. Uh, instead, players are going to probably need to reserve one less aura in general, uh, and that's going to be the new matter. You'll have one less aura, you'll have a fair amount of your mana unreserved, uh, and you will need to focus some resources on mana recovery. Mana recovery can be in the form of mana leech, mana recovery can be in the form of mana potions, or mana flasks. Uh, there'll be all sorts of different things people do, but you will need to have some investment in mana recovery. Uh, additionally, the for spellcasters, it's going to be even more noticeable. Uh, I think that spellcasters are going to find that you may, in some cases, need two mana flasks on some builds, uh, one that's an instant one and one that's a slower one. Mind over matter is going to be a lot harder to use, and the big mana archetype is going to be a lot weaker than it used to be. I don't think it's dead. Uh, I actually ran a poll on the YouTube channel recently, asking people, do you think this ma this archetype is dead? And my opinion was it's not, uh, but it's going to be a lot weaker than it is now. So with all of that said, let's go through some of the notable changes. This is not every change. If you want to see every change, definitely come and read the entire patch notes. Um, Arcane Surge, I think no longer does very much at all. And I don't think people are going to go out of the way to use it. It's no longer granting cast speed. Uh, and I don't think Arcane Surge support is particularly good at all. Archmage support is being hurt bad, but the build is not dead to these changes. Uh, it might be dead to it might be dead because of mana recovery, but the Archmage changes alone are not enough to kill it. However, Anomalous Archmage is really interesting if you stack the quality on it. Uh, you might be able to sort of con convert all of your lightning damage from Archmage into cold, but then keep converting more, and so wind up with uh, an Archmage that's providing pure cold damage and providing quite a bit more than you can otherwise get. Quality stacking is pretty difficult on Anomalous Archmage. Uh, there's a Shaper Influence Craft, I believe, uh, Maven, uh, Maven Elevated Shaper Influence Craft that enables you to do it. Uh, there's a couple other things you can do, but uh, I think that what, the very highest level of Archmage damage you can get will probably involve uh, converting it all to cold through the use of Anomalous Archmage and excess quality on your, on your gem and your items. So that'll be an interesting setup to at least experiment with. Uh, barrage support, interestingly, is basically uh, not being nerfed in any real, in any meaningful way, which surprised me. Blast Chain Mines is the next thing that I wanted to point out here. Blast Chain Mines is fine. Mines as an archetype are fine. Uh, they're going to have more mana problems than they used to with 50% uh, reservation multiplier instead of 30. 
and supported skills are now going to deal 33% less damage instead of 25% less damage. There's a small decrease in damage. Uh, a number of the other good mine supports are not really nerfed much at all. And so I expect to see Blast Chain Mine widely used still. That said, I think traps are getting buffed enough that uh, you will see that people will feel compelled to try both mines and traps. Uh, and I think that there's nothing wrong with League starting uh, Exsanguinate Mines, Glacial Cascade Mines, uh, Froze what's uh, Eye of Winter Mines seems like it could be pretty good as well. Uh, Arc Mines, all of these should be perfectly viable League starters. And I will uh, probably update my old Glacial Cascade Mines build and also have a look at, uh, at adapting it for using Exsanguinate. Because I think Exsanguinate is one of the ways you want to go. Okay, uh, Bloodlust Support is next. Bloodlust, I add here, this is a skill, this is a support gem no one used. This is the one that says you can only deal damage, sorry, that you get bonus melee damage, a mo big more multiplier against bleeding enemies, but the attack that is linked to Bloodlust can't inflict bleed. I thought there might have been space for some sort of multi-skill build that used uh, totems perhaps to inflict bleed on enemies, or even uh, the, even the uh, Summon Reaper skill that's been added for the Witch. Uh... I thought that, that might have been an option, but it turns out that it's not. Uh, Bloodlust has so many hoops to jump through compared to Brutality, and it was kind of almost worth it before when it had such a huge multiplier, but the multiplier is no longer going to be exceptionally large. It's just, uh, I think the answer is that Bloodlust support is not worth the hoops. Bone Chill support is being reworked. It's no longer as powerful as a Vortex support. It still works on skills that chill, especially through hits. It could be quite good, but it's much more questionable on Skitterbots because it's 140%, which takes it to 49% reservation now. So Bone Chill on Skitterbots might not be something you want to do anymore. Our brutality is next. Brutality should still be good, but maybe Conversion recovers as the better scaling choice. That's just going to be a thing that's going to require a lot of uh, numbers investigation. Now, Burning Damage is getting hit hard. Uh, now, I said at this point, when I was typing this, I hadn't read everything, so I'm just going to put hit hard. We will see if Ignite survives. Uh, so, burning damage has been hit pretty hard here, and it's one of the bigger decreases that, skilled, uh, that a lot of the support gems have had. Uh, we'll see if Ignite survives. I'm a bit hesitant to recommend it. There's a lot less damage available. That said, I do think there is still definitely room for some sort of um, Vile Fireball speed clearing of maps. Uh, that can definitely be done effectively, uh, and Burning Damage will find a home in that build. Uh, it's just that I think that such a build will have a lot of trouble killing bosses. When I say a lot of trouble killing bosses, I'm talking like 10 round El Hesman, so 10, 10 times that the uh, center of the, uh, of the pool fills with, with poison. Uh, is the sort of timeline I'm thinking it might be. So, you know, you're talking, a, that's for four Watchstone versions. You can do it, uh, but it's going to take a lot of familiarity with the endgame fights, and that means that it's sort of not very new player friendly at all. And I think if you're someone experienced enough to do those long El husbands, you can probably do a different build. Okay, uh, Castwind Damage Taken is the next thing. 250% uh, cost and reservation multiplier. This hurts. This really hurts skill, uh, skill setups that have three active gems linked to Castle and Damage Taken. It has less of an impact on builds that have only one thing and maybe support it. So if you have, say, Castle and Damage Taken linked to Molten Shell linked to Increased Duration, you're not really going to feel this change. If you have Castle and Damage Taken linked to Molten Shell and linked to some sort of retributive, uh, some sort of retributive damage skill or a curse or something like that, uh, then Castle and Damage Taken changes are really going to hurt. Sort of surprised that they didn't do the obvious thing and have it be 250% or even 300% at low gem level and have that scaled down as you uh, level it up, but that's that's what we've got. Uh, cold Penetration is the next thing that I wanted to point out. Cold Penetration is fine, uh, very close to its current power. Single element builds will definitely want to use Penetration gems now, partly because they're, they're just the least nerfed of anything. Uh, Tri-element ones don't want elemental penetration, uh, you can use it, but you just want Trinity instead, I think. Uh, combustion is still fine, but burning damage has hurt so badly that it is going to be quite a bit weaker. One other thing I want to add to the fireballs discussion here with uh, ignites in general 
is that Fireball is a mana intensive skill already on the 3.14 live and having 140% here instead of 120, uh, burning damage is 140 instead of 120, that alone is a considerable, considerable increase in the amount of mana that you're going to be burning through. Uh, damage on full life will see more use. The reason for that is that it has been nerfed less than a lot of other things have, uh, and so it's just looking better than it was. Deadly ailments. Here we need to talk about what deadly ailments does, because there's a lot of misinformation going around about this. So, deadly ailments does two things on live. Firstly, it gives you 64% more damage with ailments. Secondly, it gives you 10% less damage with hits. Now, a lot of people perceive this as you hit for 100 with a fireball, uh, then that drops to, then it goes to 164 would be the ignite, and then you get 10% off because that fireball hit. That's not the way it works. Uh, what this means is that you're dealing, the fireball does two things. Firstly, it actually hits the enemy, which might deal 100 damage and then it ignites the enemy, and that deals 100 damage over time. So with Deadly Ailments, uh, as it exists on the live servers, uh, instead the hit deals 90, and then the delayed burn deals, six, uh, deals 164. With the version that is going to exist after the patch, the hit is only going to deal 20 damage, but the ignite is still going to deal 144. Now that would be a bad deal overall, except for the fact that in reality, if you're playing a fireball build, it's not a case of 100 damage from your hit, 100 damage from your ignite. It might be 15,000 damage from your hit, and then 3 million from the ignite. And so that 3 million damage gets scaled up by 44%. Uh, that's pretty good. And that 15,000 damage gets scaled down by 80%. Now that might sound bad, but actually it's good, because what this change means, uh, what this line here means, is that you can use fireball with deadly ailments uh, on a reflect map on an elemental reflect map without killing yourself. I have tested out what Fireball was like uh, in previous versions of the game on reflect maps and found that you could sort of almost survive them. Uh, but now you're going to be taking 77% uh, less reflected damage as a result of this. Uh, and so, yeah, basically that's all the deadly ailments change means. The, the gem itself is worse. It's now only 44% more damage down from the previous 64%. Uh, but... This less damage with hits means that you can run reflect maps, you don't care about them, and, oh well, you still get tickled a bit. It's still going to tickle you, but it's not going to it's not going to kill you, and you can probably even use Vile Fireball on a reflect map, which was an absolute no-no in the past. So, that's Deadly Ailments. Use it. It's not nerfed anywhere near as bad as a lot of people think it is, because people just misread what it does, and they think that this 80% less damage with hits also applies to the ailments that those hits inflict, which it doesn't. So uh, next up, I wanted to talk about elemental damage with attacks. This is still looking good. You're still going to use this. It's lower, uh, it's lower in numbers than it used to be, uh, but it's still fine. Uh, elemental focus is similar. If you aren't trying to inflict ailments on enemies, uh, then elemental focus is looking really good because it's not suffering any, it's not suffering a big nerf in a world where a lot of gems are suffering quite big ones. Uh, Empower is noticeable. Empower is not being nerfed except in its mana cost. Uh, what this means is that because everything else is getting its uh, power dialed down, Empower is going to look much, 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 much better, uh, especially if you can get your hands on an Empower level 4, and even more so if you've got Empower level 4 and other sources that raise the gem level of both Empower and your main skills simultaneously. Uh, some examples of that would be a uh, corruption that says all gems in this item get plus one to level, uh, or a uh, faceted fossil exclusive mod that all strength gems socketed in this item get plus one level. Both of those will increase the empower and can potentially also increase the gem it's linked to, uh, and so they have a double dipping effect on empower. Uh, empower is looking like a big winner out of these changes, even though it's technically been nerfed. Uh, next up, Endurance Charge on Melee Stun. Uh, so people often forget that this has a huge more multiplier on it. Uh, I think it's 4% more damage per Endurance Charge on your character. Uh, it's one of those, if you're stacking Endurance Charges on your build, uh, this is fantastic. The only builds that can really do this effectively are a Slayer with Masterful Form or a Juggernaut. Uh, but if you're one of those, then you want to be using Endurance Charge on Melee Stun. As well as that, you also get an Endurance Charge when you stun something, which is a nice little bonus to have. Uh, Fist of War comes next. 
So Fist of War is the melee slam version of Unleash Support. Uh, essentially, it's a it's a bonus effect that only triggers once every few seconds on a skill, and when it goes off, it does a massive boost to the damage that a slam skill does. But I think it's it may even be a four second uh, four second uh, limit on how often you can use it. I've got to check that out. But Fist of War support is looking like it will be relatively untouched. Uh, it's definitely been nerfed a bit but it looks like it will be a pretty good skill. And I think that slam builds might want to seriously consider running a four link slam totem, a four link that is linked to fist of war, and then a six link, or even uh, two different six links, a uh, six link in your, in your two handed weapon, a six link in your chest piece. Uh, so one of them will be with fist of war. One of them will be without, and then you'll also have the, uh, also have the uh, four linked uh, slam totems. Uh, so there's lots of things you can do there to really get a lot of slam hits out. Got to test out what the exact best way to build that is, and it will be something that I put together some sort of theory crafting on. Uh, next up, Awakened Fork manages to dodge all the nerfs. Uh, I wasn't sure on that one. Awakened Fork has been very solid for a while. Uh, tends to get outshined a bit by Awakened Chain, but it is a genuinely good gem uh, and something to keep in mind. Normal Fork I don't like very much, though. Okay, so next up we have um, Hex Touch. Awakened Hex Touch has been uh, absolutely ruined. I think uh, <laughs> used to have uh, supported skills can supply and uh, can apply an additional curse. This made Awakened Hex Touch excellent. Uh, it no longer has that, and so I just don't think that there's any real benefit to this anymore. Uh, it's just bleh. Um, Hypothermia. This is gone for cold damage over time multiplier builds. Now, my initial thoughts on seeing this was that the cold damage over time archetype was killed entirely. However, I have spoken to Twitch streamer Shack Central, who's probably the single biggest authority on Vortex in, uh, and in the intervening period, and he believes that the build will survive, and he's working on a new version of it. If you want to check that out, definitely uh, have a look for Shack Central. That is uh, S-H-A-K-C-E-N-T-R-A-L over on Twitch. Uh, and have a look and see what what links he's got to uh, current status of his build. Uh, but he is, I, I will accept his knowledge as being correct. However, Hypothermia does nothing on that build now. Hypothermia on hits, however, is looking fine. Uh, I think I think that Hypothermia on hits is going to be just fine, and also um, you know can even work on builds that are using elements. But I think that's that's just much more niche. You're, you're not really going to. Uh, you're not really going to inflict chill on most enemies if you are playing a fireball build, unless you're an elementalist that's really specking hard into that. And I think elementalists have got better things they can take, even with the golem nurse. Okay, so next up we have ignite proliferation is looking kind of fine. Uh, it's been nerfed a bit, but it's not gutted. Uh, immolate is still as good as it used to be. And this is interesting. Immolate's been a support that's sort of almost been good enough to use for a while. Uh, keep an eye on this. It's been not quite good enough for a very long time. However, the thing to really keep your eye on this is the Elevated Maven Helmet mod uh, that causes supported gems to be so uh, socketed gems to be supported by level 25 Immolate. That might have some very, very good uses on it. Okay, uh, Impale support is in a really strange place now. Um, there's a couple of other buffs to Impale that come later in the patch notes. And I think at the moment that if you're playing a pure physical build, you start with Impale support and then you aim to get rid of it because it's no longer doing as much uh, at endgame as it used to. What I think you want is to have a weapon that has uh, two other damage prefixes and then has the Ashling, uh, the Ashling uh, modifier that's hybrid physical damage and Impale chance. Uh, and then with that... You then want to pick up Impale Chance on the tree. Uh, you can now get Impale Chance on jewels potentially, uh, if you need a little bit more. And then you get rid of Impale Support because the reason that it used to be so good was the fact that it had that 49% uh, increased Impale effect. Uh, that's getting nerfed down to 28% and, I, and also it's losing the uh, supported skills still 5 to 15% increase, oh, sorry, more physical damage. Uh, the loss of impale damage, uh, overwhelming physical damage reduction might seem severe, but that's made up for on the tree. Uh, increased critical strikes chance has been buffed hard, uh, but has had its uh, mana cost multiplier increased. Uh, I think that this is looking fine. This will find uses 
maybe even a few more uses than it has currently. <coughs> uh, inspiration is probably better than it used to be. And that's in spite of it being nerfed. And the reason for that is that it's, this is the skill that used to be called reduced mana support, then has a few changes. Uh, it's still reasonable from a damage perspective, but it also has the considerable uh, reduction in mana cost of supported skills. And with that in mind, and with how brutal uh, mana is going to be, I think Inspiration is going to find its way into pretty much every build that is dealing uh, elemental damage, unless they're a big mana build. Big mana builds can't use Inspiration well. Uh, Intensify is still really good in its niche. Uh, Life Tap is getting quite a bit harder to use, like quite a bit more expensive to use, but will still be good in its niche. Uh, there's also a use that I haven't really seen done for this. There is a Champion Ascendancy Notable uh, that I think it's called First to, uh, First to Stand, Last to Fall, uh, that grants you Adrenaline upon reaching low life. I think that using a skill linked to Life Tap to trigger that uh, would definitely have some potential as something that you can do when you're not in imminent danger to give yourself a tremendous combat boost. Uh, and the fact that it's gone up to 300% cost and reservation multiplier probably makes that easier to do. So I'd keep that one in mind as an option. Uh, okay, Mame. Mame linked to Flesh and Stone has been gutted by this increased uh, reservation multiplier, uh, but its use on hit skills is just okay without being great. Melee physical damage is still doing a lot of damage and is taking the 10% less attack speed, which is bad, but is not. this is still a perfectly fine support gem. And especially it's going to be good on slams. Really, really good on slams. Now we go from one gem that has a drawback that is manageable to one that has a drawback that might be an absolute gutting, and that is minion damage. So minion damage is looking like it's in a really bad place now. Uh, the 25% ma less maximum life is too much, I think. Uh, I think this is, and especially given that it's only giving 39% more damage, uh, it's got a huge cost and reservation multiplier. Uh, I think it's pro this is probably a package of changes that renders minion damage in a really bad place. I just realized I've gone past Minefield here. Uh, Minefield, I think, is now outclassed by Swift Assembly. Swift Assembly is the alternative skill that uh, also throws a lot of mines at once. And I think that Swift Assembly does the same thing, but does it better than Minefield now. Because Minefield was already probably worse than Swift Assembly, uh, but then along comes this nerf to Minefield specifically. Uh, and that just makes Swift Assembly, in my opinion, just the clear better choice. Minefield roots you in place for too long as well. It's a really dangerous skill on a mine character, which tends to not be the tankiest playstyle. Okay, um, Awaken Multi-Strike. Uh, this is getting a big hit, and I believe that it may no longer be a chase item. Uh, so it's going from a 10% less attack damage to 25%, and the first reports, uh, uh, first repeats of skills are going for, uh, getting just a smidgen more damage. All in all, it's a pretty big drop in the damage it does, and I think that it's not going to be all that good. On the flip side, it can now support melee totem skills, which might seem some use. Next one that I want to mention is physical to lightning support. This change solidified one of my planned League Start ideas. And I was looking for this, I was sort of waiting to see exactly what had happened to physical to lightning support. This skill is hardly changing at all, and that was what I was looking for. I'm thinking of League starting Absolution, I'm certainly going to do a build around it. And Absolution will probably want to use Physical to Lightning support, and basically it's not losing any of its increases in damage, uh, it's also not getting any serious nerfs along the way, like yeah it costs a bit more mana but that should be manageable. All in all I think that Physical to Lightning, and also Cold to Fire for that matter, uh, both of those gems are doing pr looking pretty good out of these changes. Okay, uh, the Poison Rework. Uh, this can technically work for Ignite and Bleed, so this is a Poison support. Uh, this can technically work for Ignite and Bleed, but is probably Poison only. Maybe Cobra Lash Crit Assassin. Uh, I can't really see a Critical Strike Fireball build that ignites. That said, uh, Rupture Deadeye is a thing too, and so like this, Poison is no longer... Poison Link, it is now Critical Strike Afflictions. Uh, it could well work with a Rupture Dead Eye. I'm not going to try and make that build, but I do think it could be done. So that would be a bleed build that is a Dead Eye that stacks Critical Strike and uses that to empower its Critical Strikes. 
Pulverize support survives well. Uh, it's taking one of the smaller nerfs and it looks like it's in a pretty good place. Ruthless support is also in an okay place. Uh, it's a big damage multiplier in the new setup. Shockwave support looks worse than it used to because it's not getting the base damage buff of other melee gems. Spell Cascade is the next thing. Uh, this is interesting. This is going to uh, this is going to uh, support skills that have the minion gem tag to affect casting them. And this has actually changed since I last read this. That's interesting. It used to just say, can now support skills with a minion gem tag. Okay, so this has changed since I um, wrote my notes on this. Uh, but what we've got here is that supported skills deal less damage. Uh, it's not getting gutted. It's, uh, you know, it, but it is a reduction. But if it's used on minion gems, then it can affect the your casting of them. Uh, and this is mostly for absolution, but it doesn't rep affect the versions that the minions cast themselves. Uh, before that extra line was applied, I was thinking I was going to be using Awaken Spell Cascade uh, on absolution. I'm now less sure of that. And I'm going to go back to Ground Zero and give that some thought. Uh, Spell Cascade might still find a use in that build. Uh, I'm just not certain. Okay, so uh, Spell Echo can, su can support Absolution though, uh, and that's something that will be worth looking at if you're going to if you decide that you want to go the Absolution route as I do. Uh, Swift Affliction. The duration nerf is painful now, and the damage multiplier is probably not high enough to make it a good overall package. So you'll notice that at gem level 20, this is actually going to have a neutral effect on the total damage that you deal. It condenses the damage down, uh, but it's not actually increasing the total amount of damage, uh, and you're spending an entire skill gem and 50% reservation uh, cost res multiplier on that effect. I don't know that I like the state Swift Affliction is in. You might use it because you have to, uh, but I think that it might be too much of a nerf to overall damage to make up for the DPS. Uh, Trap and Mind Damage support is looking absolutely fine. Uh, this is getting a nerf, but it's one of the smaller ones, and I think that um, it's absolutely fine. You also notice Swift Assembly is not listed here at all, so it's not getting nerfed. So what this means is that Traps and Mines are go. Uh, if you've never played with Traps or Mines before, then this is the time to do it. Trinity support is taking some numerical nerfs, but it was so overwhelmingly powerful before that these nerfs are not going to gut it or anything close to it. Uh, Trinity will be really, really good. It's one of the best support gems in the game still. Uh, of course, it needs to be because it's asking a lot of you. You need to be playing a skill that is dealing multiple types of damage and roughly equal amounts of each of them. Uh, and, or sorry, roughly equal amounts of the, of the two that you do the most of, or you need to be playing a prismatic skill. But... Uh, I think the payoff is there, and Trinity is looking really good, even after these changes. Unleash still looks really good. Uh, looks like it's just one of those skill gems that is still going to do a lot for you. Again, this can't, it could come in as a secondary skill. You could have a six-link setup and a four-link, and unleash on your four-link. Uh, I think that that's going to be something a fair number of people will do. Uh, you'll fire off the four-link when you stomp it still for a little while, and maybe use your six link in close range. We'll, we'll have to play around with that and work out exactly what the new meta is there. Uh, Vicious Projectiles is a, a gem that has basically dodged all of the nerfs uh, pretty much. It's looking really, really strong. Uh, more chaos damage, over, supported skills deal more chaos damage over time, more physical damage over time, and more physical projectile damage, uh, attack damage. Uh, so it's basically just an all around good skill gem still that's dodging almost everything in the way of nerfs. Uh, Void Manipulation is looking fine. Uh, the drawback is a non-event for, for most builds that would use it. Uh, there might be the odd occasional build that this is genuinely deleterious on, but for most builds, uh, the way that this interacts, like going from 25% reduced elemental damage to dealing no elemental damage is, an, is a, no difference overall. So Slams and Absolution look fine. Uh, Mines survive, Traps excel, Empower looks great, and Projectile skills look fine. So on the passive tree balance, uh, there's a number of changes. They're all pretty small, or mostly pretty small, except for the ascendancy ones that have been discussed elsewhere. So the ascendancy things are pretty big, and also there's a lot of nerfs to fortify effect. So just going through here, there's the Illuminated Devotion uh, has 50% reduced effect of non-damaging ailments on you while you have Arcane Surge. I believe that this means that when you are frozen, you will have 50% action speed. Uh, based on this assumption, this Illuminated Devotion is still strong. 
Consecrated Path, oh, sorry, Inquisitor's Pious Path, though, is gone. Uh, that's just crangled completely. Uh, there's a couple of nerfs to fortify in the champion. Uh, Slayer has had two names swapped around for some weird reason. I, I'm sure that someone at GG thinks that was a good idea. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, Pathfinder has had a couple of little, uh, a couple of little um, nerfs in there, but nothing major. Raider has had a, a, a couple of little nerfs there. Now, one thing I got wrong, I had thought that it was losing 100% on slot effect. It's losing 50%. Uh, and so I had said previously that the Raider was, uh, the Raider's onslaught wing was really severely being nerfed. I was wrong. Uh, it's a modest nerf, but it's not a gutting. Uh, the small passives leading up to Qu Quartz Infusion no longer grant 4% move speed. They now grant 10% elemental damage instead. That's worse than it used to be, but it's still good. Avatar of the Veil is granting 50% elemental al element avoidance while phasing. Uh, this is okay. This hurts the Raider a bit, but it is far from a gutting. The Raider will be absolutely fine. Uh, okay, there's the Assassin changes which have been discussed elsewhere on this channel. Uh, the Elementalist is losing the ability to have minions that are pet Aurobots. Uh, instead, the Assassin is go oh, sorry, the Elementalist is going to have to choose either in either to have combat minions as golems, like so the golems are combat minions, or alternately they can just spec into the rest of the elementalist tree. The rest of the elementalist tree is fine as well. Uh, it's just that the Alamancer side outshone everything else. Uh, it's no longer going to outshine everything else, it's just okay. What I do think you will do though is if you have three other nodes on the rest of the elementalist tree that are good, uh, you'll still take Legion of the Primordial because it's okay. It's still pretty good. Okay, uh, there's a couple of little changes to the Pantheon. Uh, one thing that's noticeable is that the Soul of Yugal is now granting Curse a reduction on you. Uh, that's going to be pretty impactful. So item balance-wise, uh, 21, 23 gems are now Incursion Temple and Divination card only. Uh, so chests that would have previously given a 21, 23 are now 21, 20. Uh, this is one of those odd things where GGG keep changing their mind as to where the best loot in the game should come from. Should it be found or should it be crafted? Uh, this is a shift towards it should be crafted. Uh, whereas the introduction of, say, Awakened skill gems uh, was a shift towards the best loot in the game should be uh, should be found. Uh, I don't really know... I don't really have an opinion on which of these visions is better. Uh, I just think that they should just make up their mind and pick one because, like, it used to be that you had, well, before Incursion, you had 21 slash 20 gems were the best you could get and they were crafted through the use of, like, levelling a gem to 20, uh, 20 and 20 quality, then Viling it and getting lucky. Then you had the Incursion Temple added, and the best gems became 21-23s. Then you had Delve added, and Delve had the inscribed chests in the gem nodes uh, that would give you a 21-23 gem. Then Synthesis came along and had those a little bit more often. Also, uh, Betrayal had 23 quality gems dropping uncorrupted. Uh, which is another thing that that existed in uh, Betrayal and in Synthesis and then was removed. Then Legion came along and started dropping 21, 23 gems like candy. Uh, then that sort of got nerfed a couple of times. And it's, it's sort of like they just can't make up their mind as to which they want. I think they should pick a vision for each type of item. Uh, and given that most of the items that are equipped to our characters are pretty much uh, crafted is the best way to get them, then I think it's fine if... if you know, you have it so that gems are mostly found rather than mostly crafted. You no longer obtain level two and higher versions of Empower, Enhanced, and Enlightened from League Rewards. Uh, you can still acquire level four from Corruption and Divination cards. So that came up a little bit. I, d I have had level three Empower drop uh, twice, I think, from League Rewards, and I've had level four uh, Enlighten and Empower and Enhance. So yeah, I've had a fair number of level four ones actually drop as League Rewards. So that will be pretty meaningful. Um, be interesting to see how that flows out. I think it will mean that there'll be a lot more demand for low-level versions of these to level, especially with this, these changes making Empower look a lot better. Uh, the secondary purpose of Catalyst is gone. Catalyst no longer can be consumed to improve the effects of an Alteration Orb, a Regal Orb, an Exalted Orb, and the like. Uh, I think this is just because no one really knew it was happening. Uh, no experienced crafters had any hard, serious statistics on exactly how it worked. Closest that we had was from the Twitch streamer Iron vs. Wild, who sincerely believed that 
the effect, oh, like he, he worked out something that, that uh, he thought was the effect that they had on orbs of annulment, uh, but it wasn't certain. Uh, there's been a couple of changes to chaos resistance on gear, and this one's an interesting one. It is much more available to get chaos resistance on gear from boot and ring implicits. Uh, amethyst rings are no longer something that you don't pick up. Uh, they're now gaining 17 to 23% chaos resistance. And fugitive boots, that's the what used to be called blessed boots. I don't know why they've changed them, but they have. Uh, they're now 13 to 17% instead of 7 to 13%. So that's quite an upgrade there. Uh, there's a bunch of changes to Veiled Chaos Orbs and the like. Uh, we sort of discussed them a bit in the Balance Manifesto yesterday. Uh, there's a number of other little things that are coming up as well. But the things I wanted to point out are the flasks. This is a, Given that we've gone so long in this video, uh, let's just jump straight to the flasks at this point. Um, forbidden Rite builds that stack Chaos Resistance. And when I say stack Chaos Resistance, I don't mean 75%. I mean you really need to overcut by quite a bit to run Forbidden Rite. Uh, builds like that should be using Doedre's Elixir and the Forbidden Taste. Forbidden Taste is copying a big nerf, but it will still be really good on those builds. Uh, interestingly, Forbidden Right, uh, sorry, uh, Doedre's Elixir and Forbidden Taste can both kill your character uh, if you drink them with negative chaos resistance, severely negative chaos resistance, which will be quite funny to see. Um, Rot Gut is surprisingly good. Cinder Swallow Urn has been gutted, but is still good. Uh, Bottle Faith is still going to be good. And the new version of the uh, uh, Dying Sun Flask will be much less sustainable, uh, but should be still good when you've got it when you've got it going. Otherwise, uh, unique item balance. There's a couple of changes that are coming up. Um, you'll notice that there's a change to Hate Forge listed here. Uh, this is something that was pre previously announced. We don't know yet uh, whether Hate Forge will be available in 3.15 or not. Uh, it may be that it's that this change only affects the ones that still exist in standard, or it may be that it's introduced in a new way in 3.15. We're just going to have to find that one out. There's a bunch of other changes. The interesting one is probably Mjolnir. Uh, Mjolnir costs, uh, does not have any mana cost when it triggers a skill, and this makes it really interesting in conjunction with the uh, in conjunction with the um, new skill Voltaxic uh, Burst. So that's the self centered self centered delayed Nova skill. Uh, I think that there is definitely a build around Mjolnir and Voltaxic Burst in it. I think that can definitely be made to work. Rumi's Concoction is being nerfed and still is very good. Uh, and then there's, yeah, a whole lot of other whole lot of other changes through here to Flasks. Uh, as I said, I mentioned the ones that I thought were most interesting. Uh, Cluster Jewel Notables. Cold stuff is, like, I think that Cold Conduction is the first one I want to talk about. Uh, where is Cold Conduction hiding? It's being reworked completely. And I just need to find it. Cold Conduction. Yeah, there we are. Ah. We just lost it. Cold Conduction. There we are. The Cold Conduction Notable no longer grants enemies chilled by your hits are shocked and en or enemies shocked by your hits are chilled. Instead, it grants 25% increased effect of lightning elements against chilled enemies and 25% increased effect of cold elements against shocked enemies. So this one's really interesting. Uh, this means that if you can do both cold and lightning damage in considerable amounts at the same time, then you can benefit from both of those effects pretty well. Uh, and I think that there's this is build enabling. This is now a build enabling stat, especially given that you can conceivably stack a few of them. However, most of the other things in here are considerable nerfs to cluster jewel nodes. Uh, the ones that matter the most... So brands are taking a beating on the cluster jewels and brands required cluster jewels to function. Uh, Holy Conquest still has its core functionality, so you can still play a brand build, uh, but brand loyalty is getting some numerical nerfs and I'd be a little bit hesitant to, uh, to league start a brand skill because of that. Damage over time multiples have been, oh, sorry, damage over time multiplier from cluster jewels have been gutted. And I think that if you are playing a build that is scaling damage over time multiplier, you probably stick to the classic tree. I don't think you want cluster jewels anymore. That's my current thoughts. Uh, or alternately, you just don't play those builds. So that's the main things there in the cluster jewel balance section. Of course, I suggest do have a read of it yourself. Uh, lastly, there's monster, monster changes here. Main thing here is just that act bosses through the campaign drop fewer but more impactful items. I uh, just got to see that in practice uh, to see what they actually are. You know, if it's if it's a couple more uniques, 
uh, that might be noticeable for leveling experience. Uh, if it's, it, pro I don't think anything that they drop will be valuable though. Here's the change that we knew was coming to Harbingers. So Harbingers from uh, the Harbinger bosses now spawn far fewer monsters. They have more threatening skills to compensate for this. Uh, so this is going to be a probably no impact on the on the loot in the form of shards that they drop, but it will be an impact on the amount of just generic loot and particularly zone specific divination cards that were spawned from the Harbinger bosses there. So we have the Zana League mods that are available in 3.15. Uh, the ones that matter. Firstly, we have Fortune Favors the Brave, uh, which is looking slightly better than usual. I don't think it's great, but it's uh, I still don't think it's great because you can't uh, synergize with it all that well. But by all means, give it a try and let me know if you get lucky with it. Uh, we have Ritual and Delirium here. Delirium was the most impactful uh, thing that's ever existed on the, uh, on the Zana modifiers in the past. Uh, Delirium is transformative of a zone, like it just adds so many monsters, it adds so much loot. Uh, the top end players will all pretty much be spamming Delirium maps, uh, like maps that have Zana Delirium on them, and this is going to cause an insatiable demand for Chaos Orbs. Additionally, we have Ritual. Players that aren't strong enough to take on Delirium maps will probably consider running Ritual and running maps in Haywark Hamlet with Ritual passives. Uh, that's going to be really, really strong. It's 13 Chaos, but it will be worth it. Uh, because Ritual was, I believe, the biggest single source of Mirrors of Calandra in the last league, in the uh, in the Ultimatum League. I think that more of them dropped from Ritual loot windows. At least this is my, uh, my understanding from talking to top-end players. More of them came from Ritual loot reward windows than came from drops on the ground. I don't know if that's actually true across the whole of the game population, uh, or if it's only true amongst min-maxing players, uh, but it does seem... It, it, it's something I believe to be true anyway. Whether, I, whether I'm right or wrong, I don't know. Uh, Nemesis is here, but Nemesis has actually been buffed a little in that areas contain five additional packs with a rare monster, uh, whereas I think previously it was it had less monsters than that. But Nemesis doesn't do as much with the 3.14 changes to unique item acquisition. Uh, it no longer grants you an additional chance to get a headhunter in that map, and it no longer enables additional strategies for potentially acquiring a headhunter through chance orbs or ancient orbs. Uh, Domination, Anarchy, and Abyss. Uh, Domination and Anarchy will only be used if there's a challenge that relates to them. Abyss has its uses. Uh, Nuvestia with Abyss uh, Scarabs and with the Maven Sextant that adds three Abysses, you can get a lot of Abysses on maps out over that way. And they can drop a stupendous amount of items, just zone, or just normal zone specific loot. Uh, so I'm definitely going to consider doing abyss farming again this league, uh, especially once my character is strong enough to tackle tier 19 maps. Uh, and so that's something that I will be using when I'm doing that. Lastly, user interface changes. Uh, this is a buff. Non-damaging elemental elements of applied to you or your enemies now display their effect. Uh, this is amazing. This is just one of those things that's going to be great to see. Uh, there's a show, there's been a screenshot shown of this, but it's just fantastic. You want to know how badly you're shocked? It'll tell you how badly you're shocked. Uh, otherwise, there's just a bunch of little things. Um, the this one's important to know. The advanced mod descriptions uh, setting has been moved from the chat category category back to the UI category. This is a setting that every player should turn on. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily essential if you're if you're not past like level forty or so, but once you get into maps, you absolutely need to have this on. It just gives you so much information on what the potential effects of crafting on an item could be. So yeah, definitely turn that one on. Uh, okay, and that's basically it. There's some stuff on what quest rewards drop where. Uh, that's something that we'll need to have a look at. I should actually just learn where Absolution drops. Absolution is offered to the Templar for completing the Siren's Cadence and can be purchased from Nessa by the people adjacent to the Templar. So there you go. Uh, so if you don't have any, if you don't have uh, any significant affinity for dexterity, then you're you're able to get that. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And then there's stuff about where you can, yeah, where you can buy all of the other ones, uh, and also a couple of changes to some of the minor minor awards. All right. Uh, then there's a whole bunch of little uh, bug fixes that will probably turn up, and there's some updates that come up here that are always important because. You never know what's going to be changed. 
Anyways, uh, that's all we've got on the uh, patch notes. I told you it would be a monster, a monstrously long lot. It's one of the biggest sets of patch notes I think they've ever had. Uh, but I'm excited. This is going to shake up everything we know about Path of Exile. It's going to make the game feel very different. And we're going to get a chance to see it when it goes live in about... Uh, oh, it's uh, less... Oh, gee, it's getting closer now. Uh, it's like less, well under 72 hours. It's like 63 hours or so. So we'll get to see it then. Uh, otherwise, hope you have fun. May your Valobs have interesting results. Hopefully this didn't just uh, fire off a Valob at your league starter plans. Uh, I will be coming back tomorrow with my outlines for how I want to build Absolution and possibly a couple of other skills.